from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. The author we have with us today is uh, fabulous. Um, his name is Justin Martin, and he's the author of the widely heralded biographies of two iconic figures, Alan Greenspan and Ralph Nader, both of whom I think would be really interesting dinner guests at the same dinner. <laughs> and I couldn't think of two different figures, and I was asking Justin a few minutes ago about that, and he said that after he had written the Greenspan book, he, he didn't want to do any more economists, uh, and that his agent was thinking, hey, you can carve out a career economist, so he wanted to go exactly in the, a, a different direction, and with Ralph Nader, he did. Greenspan, the man behind money, was a national bestseller and chosen by the New York Times Book Review is one of the notable books for 2000. Nader, crusader, spoiler, icon, published in 2002, is the definitive biography of the consumer advocate and perennial presidential candidate who sometimes leaves voice messages on my voicemail asking the Post to cover one thing or another. Uh, and he also played certainly a controversial role in the disputed election of 2000. Justin became one of the go-to experts to explain Nader appearing on CNN and other sh television shows and also in the 2006 documentary An Unreasonable Man. His latest biography is of a less controversial figure, at least by today's Twitter standards. Genius of Place, the life of Frederick Law Olmsted, is the story of the brilliant landscape architect who designed Central Park and about 50 other green spaces around the country. Olmsted also was a sailor, a scientific farmer, a crusading journalist, a noted abolitionist and Civil War hero, a life worthy of the careful, illuminating Justin Martin treatment. Justin is a former staff writer at Fortune Magazine and has written widely for such publications as Newsweek and Money. He's a graduate of Rice University in Houston and he seems to have been destined to write his current book on Olmsted as he was married in Central Park, which was Olmsted's greatest achievement. He, he also happens to live in the New York neighborhood designed by Olmsted's son, Frederick Olmsted, Jr. And with that, I'd say please welcome Justin Martin to the stage. He will be signing books um, from 4 to 5 p.m. as well. Well, thanks, Kevin, for that really nice introduction. It is so nice to be here at the National Book Festival. I'm actually here, as well as being here as an author, I'm here just as a, a fan. I've had a really great day going around seeing different speeches. It's been really fun. And um, in my book, it's called Genius of Place, The Life of Frederick Law Olmsted. Olmsted was a pretty restless genius, so I thought it makes the most sense to kind of break my speech up into a couple of different parts. First thing I'm going to, I'm going to describe the really circuitous path that he took to becoming a landscape architect, and then I'm going to briefly describe some of his greatest achievements, some of his greatest designs in the context of how all the various eddies he traveled down and career dead ends he experienced how those actually informed his most masterful designs. And then there'll be time for questions, of course. Olmsted was born in Hartford, Connecticut in 1822. He was born into a pretty prosperous family. His father was a dry goods merchant. And as was the habit in that era, Olmsted was sent away for his schooling. He entered into a whole series of arrangements with really poor country parsons. These parsons, they were besieged and beset. They had, they had their parsonage duties. Many of them were running small farms on the side in order to make extra income. And that left them very little time and very little focus for their, th for their third role as educators. Olmsted was mischievous as a boy, so he took full advantage of the situation. He was in the habit of sneaking out of these parsonages. He'd wander around, setting trap for quail, wandering around in the woods. He got very little schooling. They certainly got an appreciation for 
landscape, particularly the landscape of his native Connecticut. Now, when Olmsted was 14 years old, he got an absolutely terrible case of poison sumac, and it spread into his eyes. And at this point, Olmsted contrived to get a letter from a doctor that indicated that he no longer needed to go to school. He was delighted. But this also meant that at a very young age, he needed to find a profession. Now, the first thing that Olmsted lit upon, it kind of made sense, and it kind of was really, really illogical. He decided he wanted to become a surveyor. Now, surveying was certainly a profession that was available, in this era at least, to someone with limited formal schooling. But surveying also requires eagle-sharp vision, and Olmsted had just had this bout with poison sumac that had gone into his eyes. But never mind, Olmsted pressed ahead. He arranged to serve an apprenticeship under a surveyor. And Olmsted uh, proceeded then to completely abuse the situation. While pretending to learn the useful trade of surveying, Olmsted wandered around, hiking, fishing, paddling in a canoe. He learned very, very little about surveying, but he certainly deepened his appreciation for landscape, particularly the landscape of his native Connecticut. At this point, his father decided, time for Olmsted to buckle down, time for him to come, become more serious. So his father arranged for him to move to Brooklyn, got him an apartment in Brooklyn, and he also got him a job um, in Manhattan where he would be where he would be working um, for an importing firm. Now, Olmsted, Olmsted was deeply lonely in Brooklyn. Um, he was deeply lonely there. He also, he hated the job working for, um, for the importing firm. Uh, he hated the fact that it was a desk job. He hated the long hours. He hated the regimentation. There was really only one thing about the job that Olmsted liked, and that was that periodically he got to go on board ships and inventory their wares. And it was while doing this that Olmsted had a new idea of something that he might like to do with his life. He decided he wanted to become a sailor. Now, once again, this made eminent sense. Sailing was one of the professions available to people in that era um, that didn't have much formal schooling. What's more, Olmsted came out of this desire very honestly. Um, a whole long line of Olmsteads, if you went back generation after generation, had gone to sea. So in April of 1843, Olmsted set out on board a ship called the Ronaldson, headed for China. And on July 4th of 1843, as the Ronaldson rounded the Cape of Good Horn, the Cape of Good Hope, right beneath the southern tip of Africa, it had an absolutely ferocious snowstorm. Now, this was, the Ronaldson was traveling through the southern hemisphere, and in the southern hemisphere, it's possible for weather conditions to be reversed. So on July 4th, you can have some pretty wicked winter weather. And in this case, this was an incredible storm. Olmsted looked around at his fellow sailors, many of whom were very seasoned. He could see panic in their eyes. He realized this ship really might sink. About this time, Captain Fox, the captain of the Ronaldson, gave the order to furl sail. And what this meant was the Ronaldson had become completely uncontrollable. The wild winds were whipping this way and that. The sails were just acting as a detriment. And so they rolled up the sails, and then Olmsted and his fellow crewmen went below deck and for three days and three nights, the Ronaldson just pitched on the sea, almost like a court, completely unmanned, completely uncontrolled. Olmsted thought that at any moment, the Ronaldson might crack open, he might be pitched into the ocean, icy ocean and to certain death. Fortunately, that did not happen. Olmsted continued on to China. Um, his, the, the Ronaldson delivered its, its American goods. It picked up a load of Chinese tea and started heading back to the United States. Along the way, Olmsted experienced all kinds of privations. He didn't get enough food. He didn't get enough water. He didn't get enough sleep. He watched as his fellow sailors were whipped for even the minorest of infractions. And when the ship docked in New York Harbor in April of 1844, and when Olmsted disembarked on the dry land, he swore to never, ever go to sea again. But this only meant that he needed to find a new profession. So now Olmsted hit on the idea of becoming a farmer. Once again, this made eminent sense. I mean, farming was a profession, certainly in this era, that was available to someone with pretty limited formal schooling. What's more, farming was the profession in the United States, practiced by 70% of the population. So Olmsted identified a man who received a commendation for running a model scientific farm. And then Olmsted arranged to work with this man um, as, as, as in a sort of apprenticeship. And at this point, Olmsted was also having the very first pangs of wanting to be a social reformer. 
And so he very much liked the idea of being a scientific farmer. That would be a way to accomplish that. And the reason why is, while Olmsted didn't have much formal schooling, he was very, very well read. And so he thought that he could read the latest agricultural journals, learn the latest best practices in farming, and then he could disseminate this information to his fellow farmers, many of whom were illiterate. In this way, he could act as a kind of social reformer. So Olmsted completed his apprenticeship and started off on his own for a life as a farmer. And true to his word, Olmsted really was very talented as a farmer. He was very good at growing crops. True to his word, he also really wound up being a social reformer. He, was, he would read those latest um, agricultural journals. He gleaned the best practices, the latest cutting edge practices in farming. And then he disseminated this information to his fellow farmers. But then Olmsted learned that his younger brother, John, was planning to take a walking tour across England. And Olmsted became almost pathologically jealous. He could not believe that his little brother was getting ready to take this great adventure while he was stuck on the farm. So Olmsted started writing a series of letters to his father, in which he pleaded to be allowed to leave the farm and join his brother on this, on this trip. Now you might wonder, why would a man, now in his mid-20s, need to beg his father's permission? Well, his father held the mortgage to the farm. But his father was also a very kind, very generous man, particularly by 19th century fatherly standards. And so he agreed to let Olmsted go. And furthermore, he gave Olmsted, he staked him to some money for the tour that he took across England. Now, when Olmsted returned, he was the beneficiary of a really fortunate coincidence. One of Olmsted's neighbors on Staten Island, where he was farming, was a man named George Putnam. And George Putnam was a weekend hobby farmer. Now, Olmsted was farming on Staten Island at this, Staten Island at this point, and Staten Island was not yet part of New York City. It was simply an island off the tip of Manhattan. And George Putnam is a name that might have resonance for many of the people here in the audience today, because Putnam was a publishing magnet, and the publishing company he founded, which bears his name, is still in existence today, Putnam's. And Putnam was a real innovator. Um, he had lately been working on something called paperbacks, which was a brand new, brand new to the world in this era. And he was publishing all kinds of different paperbacks. He was publishing treatises on philosophy, collections of poetry, collections of short fiction, and he was selling them for 25 cents a pop. Putnam approached Olmsted, his neighbor, his neighboring farmer on Staten Island, and asked Olmsted if he would be interested in producing an account to be published in paperback of his recent walking tour across England. Olmsted readily agreed, and he produced a book called Walks and Talks of an American Farmer in England. Sales were very, very slow. Reviews were incredibly tepid. But Olmsted had now made an incredible transition. He had gone from being a surveyor to a clerk to a sailor to a farmer to a writer. And now comes an absolutely extraordinary coincidence. There was a brand new newspaper. This was the early 1850s, and there was a brand new newspaper called the New York Daily Times. A few years hence, it would drop the daily and become merely the New York Times. And this new paper was in a competitive fight for its life. This was the era when most big cities had about a dozen dailies. And so Henry Raymond, the editor of the new, the new paper, who's trying to figure out how to separate it from this large field of competition. He came to the conclusion that the best way to do this was by focusing on veracity. Now this, this was the era of yellow journalism, so the dozen or so competitors, they were in the habit of just stretching the truth mightily or just making things up whole cloth. So Raymond perceived that if he devoted this new paper to objective reporting, insofar as that's possible, that he could distinguish it from its competitors. Raymond was also interested in really covering some of the big topics of the day. And one of the biggest was, again, at this point in the early 1850s, once again, there were rising tensions between the northern and southern regions of the United States on the issue of slavery. These were tensions that had existed from the very inception of the nation, but now they appeared to be reaching one of their periodic flashpoints. Many people thought that there might be violence soon, or maybe there would even be civil war. And so Olmsted applied for this job, 
He had a five minute interview and he was handed this absolutely plum assignment. Now you might think, how did he get this? He, sound, he was pretty underqualified, but he did have a book to his credit. He'd written Walks and Talks of an American Farmer in England. Maybe more importantly, he was a farmer. And the South in this era was nothing if not an agrarian society. So in the autumn of 1852, after the harvest was over, because Olmsted was still a farmer by trade, he set out for the South. And the only way to describe it is nothing could have prepared Henry Raymond, the editor of the Times. Nothing could have prepared anyone for what an able reporter Olmsted proved to be. He went everywhere. He talked to everyone. He talked to plantation owners. He talked to slaves. He talked to poor white farmers. And he produced a series of spectacular dispatches that literally put the brand new New York Times on the map. Now in 1861, those dispatches were compiled into a book called The Cotton Kingdom. And all I can tell you is, The Cotton Kingdom, here it is 150 years later, 1861, and The Cotton Kingdom is still in print. And if you want a window into the South on the eve of the Civil War, you can watch the movie Gone with the Wind, which is fictional, but also certainly has some great and accurate observations about the South and the antebellum period. Or you can read Olmsted's absolutely stellar reporting as it's collected in this volume, The Cotton Kingdom. So Olmsted was now a member of what he called the Literary Republic. And next, he got an, another just plum assignment. He became an editor for a magazine called Putnam's. And Putnam's was a competitor of another brand new magazine called Harper's. And Putnam's just had an amazing stable of writers. It was publishing Emerson, Thoreau, Longfellow. While working as an editor at Putnam's, Olmsted actually copy edited a couple of short stories by Herman Melville. While working at Putnam's, Olmsted also decided that he wanted to become much more deeply involved in abolitionism. Given the fact that he traveled through, through the South on assignment for the New York Times, this was a cause that he certainly wanted to become involved in. And so in 1855, a man named James Abbott traveled east um, from Kansas. And James Abbott was the head of a militia. James Abbott's militia was devoted to making sure that if Kansas entered the Union as a state, it would enter as a free state rather than a slave state. Um, and he was headed east to, to um, get money, to raise money to purchase weapons for his militia. First he went to Connecticut and Rhode Island, and he raised enough money to buy about 100 what were nicknamed Beecher's Bibles. These were sharp rifles. Then he went down to New York. And naturally, the person he wanted to connect with was Olmsted. Olmsted was involved in abolitionism. He had a deep well of contacts in the literary community. Olmsted, uh, Olmsted readily agreed. And so Olmsted started reaching out to the various people he knew around New York City. One of the people he reached out to was Horace Greeley, who was then the editor of the New York Tribune and was the very person who coined the term Bleeding Kansas. Olmsted managed to raise about $300 through his various contacts in the literary community and elsewhere. And Abbott described Olmsted as a prompt and energetic friend of Kansas. Olmsted then, Olmsted kept Abbott apprised of his activities by writing, Olmsted then used the $300 to purchase a howitzer. And he kept Abbott apprised of his activities by writing him letters that employed a ridiculously crackable code. For instance, he referred to the howitzer as an H. Now, it, it wasn't a code that was very difficult for anybody to figure out, but at the same time, it certainly reflects that Olmsted was so very aware that he and Abbott were involved in a very dangerous endeavor here, and they wanted to avoid detection with these letters. Olmsted also arranged to break the howitzer up into several different pieces and to send it to Kansas broken up into component parts. When the, when the cannon arrived in, in um, Kansas, it was once again, it was assembled, it's reassembled, it was placed in front of the Free State Hotel in Lawrence, and it comported itself very admirably, the cannon did or the howitzer did, throughout the ensuing bloody Kansas struggles. But now comes an ab absolutely cataclysmic event in US economic history. It's come to be known as the Panic of 1857, and it was an incredibly rapid downward spiral in economic conditions. Putnam's, the magazine Olmsted had been working for, went belly up. Olmsted lost his job. Olmsted was short on coal. He owed money to everybody he knew. He had a hole in his shoe 
He didn't have a proper hat. So he decided to take a job that was an incredible come down for someone who'd recently been traveling in such lofty circles, rubbing shoulders with the likes of Emerson and Thoreau. He took a job in which he started clearing a really scruffy, unattractive piece of land. He started knocking down shanties and clearing swamps in a very ugly piece of land that was very prosaically named for its position in the middle of New York City. It was called Central Park. Olmsted was clearing this piece of land for someone else's design. Enter Calvert Vox. Calvert Vox was an English trained architect. He took one look at the existing plan for Central Park and he was disgusted. He could not believe what an amateurish design this was. What's more, Vox had friends in high places. He'd recently designed the Fifth Avenue mansion of one of the board members of the future Central Park. So Vox started approaching the board and saying, first of all, this is a terrible design for the park. I suggest that you get rid of it. And secondly, Vox said, in England, where I'm from, if you want to get the best design, you hold a public competition. The board listened to Vox. They tabled the existing design for Central Park. And then they announced that there would be a public competition for a new design. At this point, Vox sought out Olmsted to see if Olmsted wanted to be partners. Now, for these par purposes, Vox could not have cared a whit about Olmsted's high profile, about the fact that he'd been part of the literary republic, that he'd been an abolitionist, rubbing shoulders with all these luminaries. That meant nothing to Vox. The reason Vox wanted to partner with Olmsted was because Olmsted had been out on this scruffy piece of land, knocking down shanties and draining swamps, and Vox perceived that if they partnered up, that they would have a leg up in the competition because Olmsted literally knew the lay of the land. So Olmsted and Vox, they partnered up for the competition, and the only way to describe it, it was kind of parallel to his earlier Southern reporting. In this case, nothing could have prepared Vox, nothing could have prepared anyone for what incredible ideas Olmsted brought to this design. And when they turned in the design, it was the clear winner. There were 33 different people who entered the design competition. 32 of them produced something, um, produced designs that would rate somewhere between a B minus and a flat F. Olmsted and Vox produced an A plus. It was immediately seen as the design for Central Park and they were given permission to proceed with it. I'll describe here just one of the design elements that set their plan so very far apart from the other designs that were turned in by the other contestants. The board of Central Park spelled out that all the contestants had to follow certain mandatory elements. And one of those mandatory elements was that there had to be four roads crossing Central Park. Now, Central Park's a very unattractive shape for a park. It's a perfect rectangle, very narrow. The other 32 contestants, they just kind of complied with that mandatory requirement. They produced park plans that, had, that were crossed in four different places with roads. And that resulted in really cribbed, cramped plans it wasn't really possible to have an expansive meadow. It wasn't really possible to have any kind of long view or vista. Olmsted and Vox came up with this brilliant innovation. They agreed to do the mandatory element, to do the, the four roads crossing Central Park. But they come up with this idea called sunken transverses. And what these were were subterranean channels that would travel across the park at those four points. And then certain places, they designed land bridges that would cross the subterranean channels. And what this did was it opened up their park plan. It made it possible to have an expansive meadow. It made it possible to have a long view or a vista. What's more, it meant that traffic wasn't traveling at eye level as you were going through the park. As Olmsted put it, your view would not be interrupted by a clattering dung cart. Well, Olmsted and Vox's design innovation continues to pay dividends to this day. So I'm sure many of you have had the experience of walking through Central Park and there can be traffic traveling very nearby. It can be buses or, or taxis. But it's traveling through these subterranean channels, so you don't see it. And you don't really hear it either, not that badly at least, because the sound's muffled, because, the, because the, um, the traffic is traveling beneath ground. So Olmsted and Vox, they proceeded with their plan for Central Park. And they had done most of what they wanted to do. And what they hadn't done, they had in preparation, ready to go, when in 1861, the Civil War broke out. Now, Olmsted, he most certainly wanted to be involved in the Union cause. And so what he did was, at this point, he came down, to, he came down here to Washington, and he headed up an outfit called the United States Sanitary Commission. 
This was a battlefield relief outfit that just provided immeasurable relief to battlefield wounded during the Civil War. After the Civil War, through a whole series of convolutions, the United States Sanitary Commission, the very outfit that Olmsted was ahead of, ultimately morphed into the American Red Cross. But come the, the Battle of Gettysburg, Olmsted started to grow restless once again. Gettysburg was kind of a turning point in the Civil War. It was clear after that battle that the North was going to emerge victorious, the South was going to be defeated. It was really only a matter of time and terms. From Olmsted's standpoint, it became clear that it was only a matter of time before his assignment with the United States Sanitary Commission ended, and he'd need to find some kind of new job. And the funny thing is, Olmsted looked around, and he really didn't consider landscape architecture, the very profession that he and Vox had pioneered. Olmsted had a masterpiece to his credit with Central Park, but he just didn't really think there would be that, that many cities that wanted parks design. So instead, Olmsted headed out to California, and he became the supervisor of a gold mine. But while he was there, he started visiting a place that was about 30 miles away from the gold mine, and it was Yosemite Valley. Olmsted was absolutely enchanted. Now, by some accounts, Olmsted was one of the first 500 non-Native Americans to even enter Yosemite. That gives you an idea of how remote that valley was in this era and how far away and distant it was from civilization. Olmsted loved walking around in Yosemite, and pretty soon he started to make a kind of hue and cry to preserve this place. He recognized that America's population was going to expand, and at some point, Yosemite was going to be in some danger of being um, diminished um, by, by having so many people visit it. So Olmsted started suggesting that certainly no kind of private interest should be looked to to preserve this natural wonder. He suggested that a far-seeing government should step in and take care of this beautiful place. This was unbelievably prescient. This was literally, this was decades before the national park system. But the Civil War ended, and all of a sudden, in the North, at least, there started to be an economic boom. And all of a sudden, all these cities were clamoring to have parks designed. So Olmsted and Vox, they partnered up again. They teamed up again. They did a whole bunch of different designs. Then Olmsted and Vox, they never got along well. They were always at each other's throats. So they broke apart. Olmsted continued on solo, and he did a whole series of designs. And these designs, part of the reason people respond to them the way they do today, part of what makes them so singular, so magnificent, so set apart, is very much because of, because of how he drew on all the various dead ends that he traveled down and career eddies that he traveled over before finding his way to landscape architecture. He brought many of those experiences, those varied experiences, into play. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to describe just three of Olmsted's greatest works in the context of how his earlier experiences came into play. The first of these designs is right up that way. It's the grounds of the US Capitol. Olmsted was called upon to design the Capitol grounds in 1874. And the very first thing he did was he became extremely fixated on finding a way, a circulation system, a logical way for people to travel over the Capitol grounds. In this era, there were 41 different points where a person could enter the Capitol grounds. And people were the habit, in the habit of entering the Capitol grounds at any one of those 41 points and just making a beeline for the entrance of the Capitol. This produced a kind of harried grid work with people just walking in straight lines, crisscrossing one another. Well, Olmsted sat down, and he came up with this idea of having, um, the best way to describe it is it was kind of like tributaries feeding into larger tributaries, feeding into a river. Olmsted decided that what made sense was to have, it didn't matter what one of the 41 points someone entered into, they'd be fed into a tributary, it would feed them into a larger tributary path, it would feed them into one of just a couple of very broad, sinuous, curving paths that would deliver the person right to the entrance of the Capitol. Now, Congress, which was the client on this project, was completely puzzled. They'd hired Olmsted to create a striking design for the Capitol grounds, and here he was fixated over a circulation system. But this had everything to do 
It was completely rooted in Olmsted's earlier career as a farmer. When working as a farmer, Olmsted had had many times the experience of conducting his goods to market and having a wagon get stuck in a miry road. That spelled disaster. It meant the, the produce he was taking to market was going to go bad. It meant Olmsted wasn't going to get money. And so when Olmsted became a landscape architect, he kept that lesson with him. And so often clients would be incredibly puzzled, as Congress, the client in this particular case was, they'd wonder, they'd think, you know, we hired you to do an incredible project, and here you are with this kind of road fixation. But Olmsted would explain, doesn't matter how beautiful a design I create, if it doesn't have a really rational way for people to be conducted over the grounds, it'll be consigned to failure. This was so very born in his time as a farmer. The second project I wanted to describe in the context of Olmsted's earlier experiences and how they came to bear was his absolutely visionary design for the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893, what was called the Columbian Exposition. Olmsted was the one who actually cited the fair. He picked where the fairgrounds would be, and he decided that it would make sense to put the fairgrounds right on the shore of Lake Michigan. He thought that was a really striking backdrop. But then Olmsted came up with this really kind of out there idea. He decided that he wanted to cut channels that would travel from Lake Michigan through the fairgrounds, and so there would be water, there would be waterways traveling over the fairgrounds, and it would become possible for people to go from attraction to attraction at the World's Fair by boat. Now, Olmsted had a vivid, almost hallucinatory vision of what he wanted these boats that people would travel through the fairgrounds to be. He wanted them to be small, to seat a maximum of about four people. He wanted them to have brightly colored awnings. And he modeled this idea in his mind on the Chinese sampans that he'd seen during his sea voyage to China 50 years before. Now, Daniel Burnham, who was the administrator of the fair, he thought this was a ridiculous idea. He thought, why would you, if you're trying to, you know, having people travel through the fair by, vo by boat, stroke of genius, brilliant idea, but having them travel in little boats four at a time made absolutely no sense to, to Burnham. So Burnham went behind Olmsted's back and forged a relationship and signed a contract, in fact, with a steamship company. Now, when Olmsted learned about this, he was apoplectic. Um, he, wrote, he wrote Burnham a series of memos that are obsessive, demented, but devastatingly logical. He made the argument in these memos that, first of all, that ultimately the World's Fair would be consigned to memory. It was going to open in the spring of 1893, it would close in the autumn of 1893, and that would be it. So the point that Olmsted made was, what would people rather remember? A big steamship going along, people leaning over the railings, waving their hats, a steam whistle going off, or would they rather remember little brightly colored boats gliding along these waterways? Olmsted further summoned an argument that this would kind of provide the greatest amount of good to the greatest number of people. Olmsted conceded that if you had a handful of boats carrying four people at a time, not everybody was going to get to take a boat trip. But he made the point that everybody would enjoy the ambience of having these boats, these lovely, quiet little boats traveling over the waterways. Now, Burnham was a man of indomitable will. But he met his match in Olmsted. And when the fair opened in the spring of 1893, what was available were a handful of very small, brightly colored boats that could seat a maximum of four people, just as Olmsted had seen on his trip to China 50 years before. And of course, the White City, as that World's Fair has come to be known, it has an indelible place in American memory. And one of the things certainly people remember is the ambience. And one of the things that contributed to that ambience, to that kind of languid ambience, were these waterways with these little, small boats traveling over them. The final landscape that I wanted to describe or landscapes, plural, is what are known as the park systems. And this is an incredible idea. Olmsted and Vox were the pioneers of the park system. They built the very first one in the world in Buffalo in 1868. And then once Olmsted and Vox's partnership broke up, Olmsted continued on, and he kind of perfected the concept. He designed a park system in, in um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He designed one in Louisville, um, Kentucky. He designed one in Rochester, New York. 
and famously he designed the Emerald Necklace, a park system in Boston. Now one of the things that made the park system a really great idea was you were no longer, what it was was a series. You could have two or three or more parks. They were attached or they were, um, they were connected by parkways, but it meant you were no longer tied to a single piece of land for a park. And you wouldn't have to have something like Central Park, which was, until it was designed, a really unattractive piece of land. Instead, you could have several different parcels of land that, were, that might have different landscape attributes. For instance, one of them might be kind of hilly. Another of them might have, might have a nice natural lake. But far more important to Olmsted than this variety of different pieces of landscape was the fact that it meant that within the center of a city, within the middle of a city, you could have a variety of different parks, all of them serving um, different um, neighborhoods. And in those different neighborhoods, you'd have all kinds of different people um, who would be able to, from all different backgrounds, who'd be able to mix and mingle in the parks. Now this was completely drawn, so very drawn, the idea of the park system, on Olmsted's earlier travels through the South on the eve of the Civil War for the New York Times. While making that trip, one of Olmsted's most enduring observations was that the South in this time was in, a, in the grip of a kind of cultural poverty. And Olmsted ascribed this cultural poverty to the fact that people live at such great remove, one from another, that no kind of cultural commerce was possible. Plantation owners lived very far apart, and Olmsted noticed that they just didn't get together and share ideas and share information. And so the park system, what this was meant to do was to allow people to come together from all different backgrounds and all different neighborhoods within a city and mix in a kind of democratic experiment. And so I wanted to close by saying, it is, it's wonderful to be here in Washington where an example of Olmsted's landscape is so very true to how he originally designed it. And the wonderful thing is, here in the 21st century, there are so many places you can go in America where you can find Olmsted's work very much intact and you can find his vivid democratic spirit so very alive. Thank you very much. What did you perceive as the basis for uh, Olmsted's abolitionist beliefs, and do you believe that England's largely peaceful abolition of slavery affecting Olmsted and his dissuasion of England from joining the South in the Civil War? Well, let's see. The basis for Olmsted's Abolitionism is very interesting. He was what you might call a gradualist. That's part, that was one of his other qualifications for getting the Times job, which I did not mention, was that he was a gradualist. They, they wanted someone objective or sort of objective to go down there. And gradualists were people who believed that slavery was wrong, but they thought that you, know, you couldn't impose, one region of the country couldn't impose its views on another region, and that also this was a complicated institution that needed time to be unwound. And so for that reason, they thought, because he wasn't a rabid abolitionist, they thought he was a good person to send down to travel through the South. Well, the fact was, as he traveled through the South, and as you read his 48 dispatches, you see Olmsted make an amazing transformation from being a gradualist to being someone who really becomes an abolitionist precisely because of what he witnessed. And one of the most annealing things that he witnessed was he saw a slave um, what, what, one thing that happened was while he was traveling, one thing people really jealously guarded from him, the various people he met with, was the actual punishments of slaves. That was a very guilty thing for the South. So he'd get to travel around plantations, but certainly no one punished a slave in front of him. But ultimately, a, an overseer became comfortable with Olmsted, proceeded to whip a slave, and Ol it was a horrifying experience for Olmsted. First of all, he felt complicit because he actually he didn't stop the overseer. But also, he was, he, Olmsted was on horseback in a gully, and his horse flared its nostrils and rushed up out of the gully. And Olmsted took that as a, a very much a natural symbol, the horse's reaction, that this was a, a deeply morally wrong thing, slavery. And so that was one of the real events that caused him to deepen his abolitionist sentiment. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry. To, thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.